My question is uh, sort of going back to the topic of Israel and Palestine and specifically focus on Resolution uh, 242. And just to give a context to the audience, like what Resolution 242 is. So in 1967, the United Nations passed Resolution 242. And this uh, legislation requested that Israelite armed forces retreated from the territories occupied during uh, the recent conflict. From territories occupied, yes, not, terri not territories. Yes. This is actually a real uh, distinction yeah. in, in the law. Yes, it makes yes, a big yes, difference. Yes, territories. Actually. Yeah, sorry. Um, and it also stressed that the importance of resolving um, the refugee issue justly and also encouraged the end of the um, belligerency uh, claims and states. Um, however, the resolution did not explicitly state which territories um, Israel had to withdraw from uh, because of the ambiguities in the language of the English version versus the French version. Um, and this ambiguity kind of is being used as a resolution, like at, by, by the Israelites to justify its continued uh, occupation of some territories. And furthermore, um, although the resolution mentioned a just resolution for the refugee issue, um, it failed to clearly address the right of the Palestinian people to statehood. And from my understanding, that is the reason why a lot of the Arab nations sort of reject that resolution. So my question for you is, if you were in their shoe, if you're a Palestinian, um, aware that there's imprecise, impreciseness within the resolution um, that will potentially put your people in disadvantage, um, how would you respond to that? And whether you will um, accept the partisan deal um, or were you rejected? And before you um, answer, I'm ready to be destroyed by Ben Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the answer, if I were a Palestinian citizen, which fortunately I'm not because it's horrible to live under the Palestinian Authority or Islamic Jihad right. or Hamas, um, but if I were, I hope that what I, what I would be doing is pressing for a... Uh, just want to briefly note that there's no such thing as a Palestinian citizen. That's the problem. Yeah a full-scale attempt at a, at a peace deal that would mm. involve a two-state solution. The biggest problem with the two-state solution right now is that one side wishes to exist and the other side wishes it not to, and that's a, that's right. a serious problem. So if that were to alleviate, there's, mm. there's been heavy movement for decades in Israel for ceding territory, which is why Yasser Arafat was in charge of areas of the West Bank, which is why the Gaza Strip, which was completely ceded, to the Palestinians in right. 2005. Israel removed 8,000 Jews from the Gaza Strip mm -hmm. in 2005. They did not have internal military presence in the Gaza Strip, which is why they didn't actually have any intelligence as to what was going on on October 7th. And so the, also the, false. the, the obvious answer Famous. would be that if a Palestinian government were to arise that mm -hmm. were trustworthy and credible in its pledges not to actually attack and, and use their, their new state as a yeah. base for attack, and that would require time and trust, and that would have to be built up over time, given the amount of distrust in the region, which would mm -hmm. allow for presumably gradual, gradually increasing control of borders with, say, Jordan. Right? If you're talking right. about yeah, yeah. the West and Bank, it would also yeah. require land swaps. I mean, all these things have been discussed by Israel before. They were proposed in 2008 by Ahul Olmer. Mahmoud Abbas literally got up and walked away from the table without a counteroffer. Yeah. So the, when it comes to you know, the, 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 practic the, the practicality of solution, that rests on whether the Palestinians are willing to have a government at any point mm -hmm. that would actually make that peace deal. And it was interesting. I, I was at Oxford last night, the other university. I, yeah. was, I, was, at, I, I, was, I was there last night and, <laughs> and student after student got up and asked about this. And then yeah. I asked them a simple question. They kept talking about occupied Palestine. I said, what do you mean by occupied Palestine? And invariably to a man yeah. or woman, each one of them said everything. Like from the river all the way to the sea, that's occupied. Well, you can't make peace yeah. on that basis, of, of course, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as far as whether Israel's been willing to do it, yes, Israel will be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. But again, that's going to take time and it's going to take credibility. That's what Oslo was supposed to do. And it never even came remotely close to achieving that credibility, largely because Yasser Arafat is one of the worst people who has ever lived in an arch terrorist. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would be like sort of your solution to that? What would you propose if you're the one that's mitigating the deal between Israel and Palestine? I mean, right now, there's no deal to be actually mediated between, between right, just the, two in the parties. Hypothetical in, in the magical hypothetical deal, it would end up looking like the Palestinian areas that are currently governed by the, that, that are currently largely Palestinian would end up under Palestinian control. It would look like land swaps, probably, where the Israeli areas outside the green line, like Afra, which has 30,000 citizens living out there, yeah. that was not going to end up in Palestinian control. You're going to have to have a land swap somewhere else. I mean, that, that's, everybody sort of acknowledges that that is the, the, the way that it would, would go. Even, even Likud, which started off anti-Oslo, once that was the reality on the ground, started to embrace a lot of the language of the two-state solution. So again, I think that the, 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 everyone in the West is trying to jump to the solution without recognizing the failure of the premise. 
if you have two parties who are willing to make a deal, a deal is available. Mm -hmm. And if you only have one party who's willing to make a deal, a deal is not available. Right. right now, only one party is willing to make a deal. The other party has shown itself repeatedly, literally for all of Israeli history, unwilling to make a deal. There's not been a single deal accepted by the Palestinian Arabs or by their predecessors. When I say the predecessors, I mean the, the Arabs who were in Palestine but didn't consider themselves nationally Palestinian at the time. People who were Syrian, people who were Turkish. The Peel Commission in 1937 recommended a significantly smaller state of Israel. The Jews accepted it. Yeah. The Arabs rejected it. This has happened over and over and over. 37, 48, happened again in 2000, happened again in 2008, like over and over and over and over. So again, the, it all comes back to the same point. Once there's a peace partner, you mm -hmm. can talk. Until there's a peace partner, there's no talks. Thank you so much. I feel being destroyed, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, so it is interesting. I will say this is the first time I've ever hear, heard Ben Shapiro sort of say, I mean, I guess he didn't quite say the words, but at least heavily imply that uh, he would, in theory, at some unspecified point in the future, not anytime soon, uh, be okay with there being uh, an independent Palestinian state, um, which is progress for him. Uh, that's uh, he definitely didn't used to hold that position. In fact, famously, uh, as a very young man, uh, he, uh, he he wrote an article advocating the the forcible transfer of of all the Palestinians uh, out of the country. Um, mm. But uh, you know, which I know he's. Um, you know, I, I know he's like said since then that it's like, oh, that was dumb. I shouldn't have said that. But uh, but but that is that is a position he's once taken in print. And I've never heard him before this say there should be a Palestinian state. Although, again, I think he made it very clear that he's not advocating anything that would, you know, he's not advocating a Palestinian state now or next year or the year after that or the year after that. But like at some point in the theoretical future, if a bunch of boxes were checked that I think we all know Ben Shapiro is never going to accept. Uh, have all been checked, right? Then, like, theoretically, I guess he's saying he would be okay with the Palestinian states. That's still that's still forward movement. But um, he is just wrong in saying that Likud uh, has this position. No, they fucking don't. And um, there were times when Netanyahu, like, hinted that he'd be willing to accept a Palestinian state. But in 2015, he outright said there will never be a Palestinian state as long as I'm prime minister, right? I mean, like, he's never taken that back. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what he's talking about there. I mean, as far as, um, you know, the sort of Arab rejectionism narrative that, that he's doing, I mean, the first point to make is that up until 2000, none of these examples have anything to do with the Palestinians, right? Like he's talking about like, so in other words, it's it's bad enough to talk about every single Palestinian like there was a Palestinian hive mind, but like in this case, he's talking like there's an Arab hive mind, right? So the Palestinian, you know, the Palestinians are sort of responsible for like the diplomatic decisions of like the Kingdom of Jordan in 1948, you know, or like Egypt in 1948, right? These non-Palestinian uh, Arab states. So anybody who's like any country where Arabic is the national language, which is all Arab means, right? Like that, that's all basically one thing in Ben Shapiro's view, which is incredibly racist, but uh, in, uh, in any case, so it's like none of the pre 2000 examples uh, have anything to, to do with Palestinians. So it's like, you can't really try to force that into that like weaselly phrase about their predecessors. It's like, no, that has nothing to do with the Palestinians under any name. So like, the first real example would be 2000 of like representatives, at least of a Palestinian faction, right. Um, rejecting, you know, being offered and rejecting a deal. And then the next, you know, the next obvious question would be, Oh, what sort of deal would that be? Would that be Israel, you know, fulfilling its bare minimum obligations under international law uh, that, you know, 242 aside, right. It's very unambiguous that under international law, you are not allowed to get new territory through conquest, right? So even if 242 had never been passed, the the bare minimum requirement under international law would be to withdraw to the pre-1967 borders, which by the way, even if you believe in the general idea of a two-state solution, you know, which I think I've been pretty clear, you know, which personally I don't, you know, uh, I, I would sort of accept that 
if if that were like if that became possible, right? If that became politically viable, right? Like right now, it's really hard to see how it happen. I wouldn't make the perfect the enemy of the good. I would say sure if that's like the most justice as possible, then like that's that's a step in the right direction. I'll take it, right? But the um, but in principle, right? I don't particularly I don't want to partition Israel into different ethno states, right? I just you know I, I just want to give everybody equal rights. But in the um, but putting that aside, even if you do believe in the framework of a two state solution, like if Israel had full had 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 offered to fully withdraw to its pre nineteen sixty seven borders, um, that would still be a massive, massive, like world historic kind of concession for the Palestinians to accept that because that's like what they're what they're they're thereby accepting is twenty two percent of uh, the of the overall country being fought about, right? Um, when it's about half the you know population overall. So, um, and then like, what was the, the deal that like you're saying, oh, the bad thing is the Arafat didn't accept this was not that because, uh, it would be like Ben is saying, uh, it would have kept all of these illegal Israeli settlements in place. And so it's like, oh, here's some like scrap of land that's, you know, within the green line that, you know, you can have like an exchange for that or whatever, but like, um, it would not be accept- it would not be like letting the West Bank as a geographical unit, right, be released into a Palestinian state. You'd be keeping all these uh, Israeli settlers. You'd be keeping. You'd be crisscrossed with uh, Israeli roads uh, that you know that would be under Israeli control. Um, like calling this a state seems a little like much like a much of a stretch to begin with, right? If you're talking about like some discon- disconnected cantons that have all this Israeli stuff all over them. And then uh, certainly I know when he's also referred to the the only other real example, right, in this history of like a Palestinian representative. And, you know, it's not like there were referenda about this among Palestinians, but like some sort of Palestinian official uh, declining an offer deal. The only other real example besides 2000 is that 2008 one that he's talking about, the Mohammed Abbas uh, Ehud Olmert one, and I know in that case, like once again, keeping a bunch of Israeli settlements in place, uh, connected by Israeli roads. And uh, in that case specifically, I know there was also going to be continued Israeli military presence. So it's like at that point, how different is that from just like relabeling the Palestinian Authority a state? Right. That's that's not uh, that's not a serious deal. But then um, but then the last thing I just say about this is like, OK, let's play pretend let's assume for the sake of argument that this whole narrative of you know arab rejectionism you know palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity all that shit right let's just assume that that's all true even if we did accept all that for the sake of argument i don't think its conclusion would fall from that like um like if you if there are diplomatic reasons outside of israel's control why it couldn't partition into two states. Well, if that's the case, and according to Shapiro himself, that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future, if Israel was a democracy, what it would do is said, okay, well, we're not in a position of partition, so therefore everybody who lives within our current borders is going to become an Israeli citizen, right? Like what possible excuse do you have not to do that at that point, right? Like if you're declaring your intention not to leave this area, to, to keep them within your country for the foreseeable future, what possible excuse do you not have to not just offer citizenship and equal rights to, to everybody who, who lives there? And I think that's the, that's the question I really wish that, you know, very nice and nervous young man had asked uh, <laughs> have to deal with. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, I don't really have anything to add. This is a topic I just don't know enough about the facts and it seems like you got a pretty comprehensive. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. Our uh, producer Jordan in the chat, uh, uh, who uh, who who lived there for many years, uh, fourteen years, says uh, Lukud pretended there for Oslo once he was already more abound, just to wield the loss against them. They blame Ehud Barak uh, for uh, political points and incited violence, famously against the attack Rabin. <laughs> You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. 
to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.